Hello everybody, welcome to Wise Exotics. I'm your host Trevor, and today we'll be discussing the dark side to Nepenthes. Now that being said, I'd like to give a general warning that this can have some hot button issues and or topics, and I just want everybody to be aware of them. I'm not pointing fingers, I'm just giving general information now and allowing you to understand the root or cause of various problems with these Nepenthes or why things have occurred and or what's being done with them. Now, to start, Nepenthes are majorly affected by poaching, and I'd like to point out for a fact, all Nepenthes are from the wild at one point or another, meaning your planet is either directly from the wild or ancestrally. Now, these plants have been in circulation since even the Victorian days and days of kings and queens, and they were kept as prized um, plants. So, keep that in mind. These plants have been around for a while. Doesn't mean all of them are kosher. <laughs> There's usually a bad, a good, and a big gray area for why things are done. Now, as to poaching, typically it's done in one of four ways. A, the poacher will go in and find a plant, tear it out by the roots, and bring it back. That usually is detrimental to the plant and will more likely kill it. Not smart. But a lot of these are being done in third world countries, and they're more likely just thinking of taking the plant out and selling it to tourists. As an example, just to make some money to feed their families. Second type, they take cuttings, which means they take a basil or a cutting from a vine and whatnot off of a main plant. Next type is they take the pollen off of male flowering plants. And then the final type is they take seed pods and then bring those in and grow them in their nursery or their own private collection and grow them out. Now, these can be done by single individuals. If you'd like to see such an impact as one, please refer to my VGI discussion video. Um, this can be done with a group. This can be done in organized crime, and that's been accounted for and documented in a variety of Nepenthes videos and documentary and such. Um, that being said, you might be wondering how this occur. Well, typically Nepenthes are found in forests, so sometimes the tour guides or local villagers will just go off and do this themselves. That's one such thing. Sometimes outsiders will come and take it uh, just because it's in an area that's not well known or it's a newer unknown species and the like. Now, a lot of the Nepenthes that are endangered or in critical areas are actually in protected reserves, such as with armed guards, usually with guns, not like bowie knives or machetes, but actual firearms. So you might be wondering how these people are poaching these plants. Usually they will bribe the guard with chump change, typically, like just pocket change level of here's here's a five let me in and they'll go in collect a bunch of plants and sell those plants for thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars so realistically i kind of feel bad for the guards because the guards are endangering their job number one their livelihood the plants and everything for just chump change they're not even getting paid anything near equivalent so this could be guard or guards or a group of guards or whatnot so please keep that in mind now as with the case of rigid defolia, there's actually kind of an extensive history of things going on with that plant more than what I thought. Now, rigid defolia was found originally uh, off of by a roadside. It was thought to be a new species, and it was taken off uh, with the intent of researching it and finding it, and was originally discovered and labeled as species number six, and sold out, if I recall correctly, through Malaysian tropics. Uh, later, it went through various name changes and was finally settled upon the name Rigidifolia. But because it had such an initial small population by roadside, it was very easy for people in vehicles to drive up, get out, take all the plants, get back in, and drive away. And that happened within almost 24 hours after they started becoming popular type of concept. Um, another population was found further away. Same thing occurred. And then finally, a single male and hybrid with spectabilis was found. And again... Same thing occurred, it was poached. Now, that being said, um, there is a lot of uh, horticultural, hopefully, to come crosses with rigid defoli in mind to hopefully restart the species. But the main premise of it was it's a species that was originally unknown. It was being researched at the time, and during the time it takes to research and or separate it out and or name it, during that time, it was poached, basically. Now, as in the case with Clipiata, 
Clypeata actually was an uncommon Nepenthes, but was not originally endangered or rare. It was available through the horticultural trade in various ways and places. A lot of people have mature Clypeata female and male flowers in their collection uh, specimens. You might be wondering, well, what happened? Natural disaster. Yep. Forest fire. Wiped out a huge chunk of the forest and the species population because, you know, these are plants that live in trees and cliff sides. It barbecued the lot of them. Now there was a population further away on a volcanic mountain area that survived and that got decimated by poaching. Almost 150 plants were discovered, uh, torn out and ripped out. So the first type. And this was done through organized crime. Later they were arrested and the plants were, as best they could, re input it into the wild there was another population found further in on a very sharp and jagged mountainside that is very difficult to get to without risking your life so that's what's keeping that population stable and safe so yay go clipiata now another such issue that occurs in my opinion is limited information or lack of scientific application and you might be wondering what do i mean by that well, typically Nepenthes are labeled or researched through observation. So say you have six plants that all look alike, you can say, well, these are all cousin species. You didn't actually genetically test it? No, but because they look similar, I'm going to label them as such. That can kind of be a problem. Sometimes they will label a plant either accidentally, purposely, whatever, as a hybrid that's not actually a hybrid. And how hybrids are treated is much different than pure species. If it's a hybrid, it's okay to take them out of their population because they're detrimental to the pure species that generate it, unless, you know, it's the two pure species generate the hybrid, not hybrid bred back to the pure species. They don't want that, so sometimes those populations are culled and or removed and or moved in some cases. Now, this is one such case that happened with macrophylla. It's critically endangered just because it has a very low population they're very slow to grow. I have one in my collection, and I would like to state it's probably the slowest. Um, low EI is probably right next to it, but even my low EI grows faster than the macro. Um, I have one that's from 2018 that's basically the size of a match right now. And they're very sensitive, uh, but they're very unique to look at, even at a small size. They're, you can easily tell they're a macro due to their leafage and the coloring and the texture. Um, that being said, I honestly, looking at the two plants, don't understand where they got this concept, but basically they originally thought Macrophylla was a hybrid between Velosa and Edwardsiana, or say Edwardsiana and Velosa and maybe Loei. There is a natural hybrid between Macrophylla and Loei, Calchus maliensis, that does occur in the wild, so they thought maybe it was like a hybrid of a hybrid, so XX type of thing, but what was found through botanical research there was one in a nursery and they decided to do a um, sequence the dna of all the plants that were available and compare them they found that macro wasn't related to either of them in a way that a hybrid would be in fact it was more of a cousin species and that status went from being hybrid to critically endangered single species so that's how that affected them now it happens, there's a lot of this where it goes on, as I said, or they label one plant one name or one type, and then using actual science with genetics and whatnot, not just observational research, they find out, oh, that's not what it is, or it's more related to this. And in truth, I'm really surprised nobody's done this with Ravicantley and Nebularium just to shut down that whole argument that's been going on. But they more or less just want to argue back and forth with visual observations or example hybrid clones could be you know mate just take the genetics compare them this is not rocket science this is genetics you have a sequencer available to you in your country and or nation and or state you have this availability just use it i don't understand why we're not using genetics to test and or verify these plants it doesn't make sense to me as a scientist Anyway, you might be wondering, what are some means that are being done conservation-wise to help protect the plants? Well, as I said, there are natural reserves. Uh, there are armed guards, but that doesn't always protect. Even if you somehow got a poached plant and, by accident, either through a nursery or a third party, and you wanted to send it back, 
doing so you're endangering that plant further because importing it from wherever it's from to your country there's a big weight there's a lot of darkness it doesn't get to eat so it's very starved it's very weak and it's very stressed and it will take a while to recover if you immediately send it back without letting it recover you are endangering that plant further and are more of a problem than say the original poacher because that plant's already alive in your care there's no reason to kill it now some people have gotten these plants and even some of the rarer ones or a plant that became rare like rigid folia and they donated them to botanical nurseries or they sent them to major nurseries with uh legal documentation stating they cannot use it for profit they have to use it to try to bump up the horticultural trade those are legal binding documents and if they are violated they are sued type of thing <laughs> so there are ways to protect yourself and the other plant if this such occurs again i'm not attacking anyone things happen uh buying from any of these nurseries is not 100 percent a guarantee because these nurseries have all been caught all around the world red-handed either poaching or buying from a poacher or buying from a proxy of a proxy from a poacher so some indirect means of getting that plant from a poacher and usually it's all about profit because it's a rare plant they can hoard them let them die off in the wild and so the price of them in the horticultural trade skyrockets so not all botanical nurseries and whatnot are doing it out of the goodness of their heart some of them are doing it purposely to try to skyrocket the prices not all some of them are honestly out there trying to help but some of these have also been involved in the very thing that they're against so kind of keep that in mind but as i said no matter where you get independence from it's originally from the wild now there are cases where these plants are removed from the wild due to overpopulation keeping any more within that population can be detrimental to the ecosystem and those plants themselves so sometimes instead of just tearing them up and destroying them like weeds countries will allow those plants to be pulled out potted and sold into the botanical trade so that's a one means some of these plants that aren't rare or are just basically common to them are being sold out as rare tropical plants that occurs with a lot of them as well so there's that there are means at which scientists are going in to take samples or take some seedling pods and they're allowed to by the government with restrictions in mind to use them for horticultural trade and produce more for that anyway i hope this video has given you some insight and some food for thought and allowed you to make more critical um informed decisions when buying nepenthes online I wish you all the best of luck, and I hope you guys have a great time. Cheer out.